So we start now, right? Thank you. OK. So hello again. <laughs> and welcome to the next, to the second lecture. Today we're going to talk about money usages in Siberia. Also, we take the same period of time we took last time, 18th, 19th century. And when talking about Siberia, it is very important to say that you will not see the dynamic picture uh, of money usage. Um, partially because the territory itself is huge, was huge and is huge, and uh, the information that is given is district, so discrete. So uh, it can be used as an evidence only for some certain period of time, for some certain period, uh, some certain year. So this is why we will not see the dynamic, but we can guess about the dynamic. And uh, an interesting thing about Siberia is that uh, while studying this uh, region and literature on this region, uh, I came across many, many times that Siberia was not included in the term Russian Empire. Uh, it, it, it could happen like, like here in statistical tables of the Russian Empire. It's, almost second half of the 19th century, and Siberia was uh, included into the territory of the Russian Empire uh, since uh, the end of uh, 17th century, and even earlier than that. And still, it's the 19th century, and Siberia is not included in the statistical tables, and only information about the European part of Russia is given. You can also find terms Russian Empire and uh, Siberian region written separately in legal acts, in correspondence. And this is why it struck me that Siberia was treated as a colonial type of territory, as a resource donor for the European part of Russia. And uh, the special treatment of the territory itself could be very easily demonstrated by a very well-known example of the mintage of special Siberian coins, known to everyone, uh, that the mintage was occurring uh, in uh, 1766 till uh, 1781. Uh, So-called Siberian coins did have different weight in comparison to that period of time copper coins, so the weight was 25 rubles out of 16 uh, kil kilograms of copper and if if you see if you see here the two tables so during this period of time of 1766 and 81 usual copper coins uh, circling circulating around european part of russia were uh, heavier, so they were like 60 rubles out of 16 kilos, and Siberian coins were lighter, 25 rubles out of 16 kilos. This was the objective necessity uh, due to some technological complications, but still um, it was strictly prohibited uh, to circulate around the European part of Russia. So these coins were allowed to circulate only uh, around the Siberian region. And the volumes of coins during all this period of time counted around 3.5 million rubles. Um, it's hard to say whether it was enough or not enough, uh, but later on we will see that generally speaking, Siberia had some problems with deficit of money uh, during all period, during 18th and 19th century. So all the uh, towns and cities of Siberia were founded as a military base. And the first governors of these places were actually active uh, military men, voivodas, who, generally speaking, were exploiting the territory pretty badly, uh, taking taxes. Um, it was a huge terror over the territory till the beginning of the 17th century. So kind of a order started, some administrative order started to happen in the middle of the 17th century when laws were enacted, when territory was treated in a more legal way. But, uh, and uh, with the, the only source of money that could happen to Siberia was with the people that were migrating to Siberia. So these were the first 
Cossacks that conquered the territory, they were bringing money with them as a salary for their duty. Uh, and they also brought some sponsorship from private parties uh, while conquering the territory. And later on, once the administrative units were being developed, once people were migrating and even the prisons were built, manufacturers were built, convicts were sent to Siberia, more and more money was, uh, was uh, injected in, in that particular way. So with, with the coming of the Russians from the European part of Russia, because those that were living there were basically tribes and nomads and they didn't need money, they were not using that. And we will see later on what kind of trade, uh, in, in which form they traded actually. So the next thing, uh, the next thing is to, to ask ourselves what kind of money during the 18th century actually was circulating around Siberia. And this is kind of interesting because previously I was studying 19th century and there was no doubt that copper coins were circulating around the territory. But when we are thinking about the 18th century, I found out that more and more reference is given to small exchange silver coins. So if we start from just the very beginning of the 18th century, we find the legal acts uh, saying that, it, and they speak about the western part of Siberia. Let us see, let us take a look here. So the western part of Siberia and the eastern parts of Siberia goes here. So they, they, what, what, what they say basically, uh, you can read <laughs> the translation here, but the interesting thing that they're using the word Altin and Dinga and Altin was the name for a certain nominal in silver, which means they're talking about silver coins rather than copper coins. There were no such nominals and even names to the nominals uh, attributed to copper coins at that period of time. So 1700, uh, in 1700, and, and Altin meant three kopeik, right? And Dinga meant one over two, or one half kopeik. So three cents and one half cents. And at that period of time, copper coins were not so hugely minted. I'd rather say that in reaction towards the chopping of uh, silver coins, they started to mint copper coins. So this were the period, was the period of time when silver coins were uh, minted. And then we see another example is a later age, 70, 35, and the next one, 39. So the first act is talking about the further district of Siberia. Let us see which one, this one, further to the east. And what it says, it says that the tax should be taken in sables, in kind, not in money. So it instructs to take the tax in sables, not in money. And originally, when the territory was being conquered, they took the taxes in, in sables because nomads could could give the tax only in kind, in, 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 it, it was called Yasak. So here we also see the same kind of, um, uh, same kind of tax, which is made in, in, in kind. On the other hand, we find out in the same district, because how, how do we know that it is the same district? Because another act is the response to the report of the vice governor of the Irkutska district saying that some of the tribes of Mongols, they can be, um, the taxes that can be collected from them, not only in kind, but also in money. And the instruction goes further. They say in the acts that you are allowed to take silver and gold coins from them, but not copper coins from them, which gives us just the assumption that probably there were silver and gold coins in, in the tribes, in these particular Mongol tribes. Uh, and even they could have been copper coins around them, but it doesn't prove that they were circulating there. And why are, it, so it gives some, some clue, but it, it can't prove that. And the report that was made by this vice governor could have been made in the very common manner that most reports were made at that time. We will see it in another paper, like, like ha, uh, producing information by rumors. So. The, these are the facts that can, cannot be fully um, proved. 
Okay, before, before we go to this example, I read another example, which I don't have that slide here. In 1747, so we're moving a little bit further, Yekaterinburg Mint started to make extra 1 million ruble of copper coins in nominals one, one uh, half and one fourth ruble for the purpose of exchanging them on small exchange silver coins and high nominal silver coins. Again, this fact doesn't prove that they, that they started to circulate immediately. But still, it means that the state started to exchange and to take silver coins out of the circulation and to bring copper coins into the circulation. Uh, not particularly in that, in that year when the act was made a little bit later, but still. And final example, uh, again, taxes paid um, laid on peasants in silver, which is also an interesting example because usually you find even in Kuroda, Kenoba papers, we find that copper coins were associated with peasants because of low nominals and uh, the volumes of transactions. And here we see that the tax is laid actually in silver coins. How do we know that? The name of tax is uh, six griven uh, money. And grivna was also the name for the nominal only for a silver coin. There was no such a name for uh, any nominal in the copper coin. And uh, six grivna means uh, six multiplied to 10 kopeik. So it's 60 kopeik per year. So again, the tax is laid uh, and the name of the tax attributes to the, uh, to the way it can be paid. It might be paid. So all these example, examples could be the proving and could be the evidence that on this territory, around the uh, 18th century, silver small exchange was used for at least paying taxes, at least paying taxes. And next thing, let us see. So it may seem unnatural that uh, peasants were using silver in their transactions and it's not clear whether they were, but if we see this age and take a look at the production of copper coins by mints, we see that around that period of time, not so, much, not so many copper coins were produced anyway. So it could be um, the reason why peasants were not using copper coins, just because there were not so many of them produced. So here you see the diagram of the production of copper coins uh, all summed up. And five mints here, Moscow Mint uh, in orange and St. Petersburg a little bit here. Most colors go for the Yekaterinburg mint. Here a little bit of yellow is the mintage by Izor was used temporarily. Uh, you, you may notice actually that the years when it was used for mintage of copper coins were exactly the years of the first attempt to enact the silver standard and the next years were exactly the second attempt and successful one to enact. Um, silver standard. Anyway, these are all volumes for the whole Russian Empire. So you can imagine that these were all produced for the whole territory. And European part of Russia was the priority, that's for sure. While the, what, it, what was left was given to the Siberia, Siberian region. And so we can think that uh, at least till half, half of the century, not so many copper coins were at, at all circulating around Siberia, so we can assume that small exchange silver coins were used instead, even by pe peasants. So, um, so how, how do we know, uh, how was the distribution made uh, from these mints? And I will read you just a small uh, description from the uh, um, report on the supply of copper coins. So the copper coins minted in Yekaterinburg are going to be supplied in Permska, Vyatska, and Orenburska part of the Bolska province. We'll see the map right now, just a second. So here, this is St. Petersburg mint. Here is the Yekaterinburg mint. And here is the Suzun mint that uh, I decided to draw your attention to. So what we are saying, what the director of Department of Mining and Salt is saying is that the copper coins minted here are, go, are going in majority to European part of Russia and only to one province, Tobolsk province, which is here. 
uh, and from these provinces, meaning the European part, the coins can be moved on horses and by Chusevaya Kama, Volga till Caspian Sea, by Don till Azov Sea, by Oka till Kolomna. If you notice this arrows, so the money goes down here and down here. Suzun will supply Tomska, Irkutska and part of Tobolska provinces. It is easier to supply money there as the peasants from other parts of provinces are working on the manufactory, are receiving this coin for their work. So this, this manufactory is giving coins here, Tobolsk, Tomsk and the, uh, Irkutsk, which is already in the eastern part of Siberia. So Suzun by itself is supplying the western part of Siberia, a little bit goes from Yekaterinburg and very little amount goes from Suzun to Irkutsk province. And just by comparison, Suzun is producing this one, the blue one, is producing on average 250,000 rubles per year in comparison to Yekaterinburg, which is producing 2 million per year. So it's just in comparison with a small amount for the Siberia. And let us go further then. We also find, uh, just a sec before we are moving to prices, these are the prices from Taborska region. Uh, it's the western part of Siberia. So Taborska region, the one on the map that I was showing, is very, it was very known uh, for being dominated by currency by small exchange, by coins. It was quite natural because it did contain, uh, um, on this territory you could find very important uh, fairs like Irbitska fair, Yushimska fair, and it was just in the middle of the trade uh, road from Irkutsk to Nizhny Novgorod. It was situated near Yekaterinburg, between the Yekaterinburg and Suzun Mint. So there were many, many, um, prerequisites for this area to be dominated by currency together with higher population, population higher density. Um, so here I found some prices. Yeah. They are all qu quoted in silver actually. So what, what they say is uh, the prices uh, from 42 to 47 year. This is taken from statistical tables of military, military statistics. So these are the tables. This is funny. I mean, the statistics is given by military men saying which region can bring, what, what benefits which region can bring to uh, army, where you can find, where you can feed your soldier and so on and so forth. So here are the average prices for uh, cereal, for flour, and here is the prices for particular year, 46. And one ruble, 89 kopeik, three rubles, 65, and one over four, I think, kopeik, uh, for four kilos. So what is interesting is that they're quoted in silver. And the year that is taken is obviously, they, they should be quoted in silver because in 1839 there was already a silver standard in Russia. But it's not possible to imagine how you pay uh, this, much mo th this, this money in, in silver coins just because the fractional part uh, doesn't allow us to pay using silver because the lowest nominal you find at this period of time was five kopeik. So, these were probably paid at a market rate in copper coins. So this is, this is some kind of a assumption for the uh, circulation of copper coins around the um, western part of Siberia, mainly the Tobolska region. Next thing what we're going to talk about is still the fact that even though we find evidence of the money circulation there, we can, we can assume that there was a deficit of that. First of all, because of the transportation cost, because most of the provinces, they had the uh, river systems that were not connected to each other, so you had to transport the money uh, on horses. And um, the further you move, the higher costs are to transport the money, so it's quite, obvious that bringing money to Irkutsk and to far, far on the east is harder, is costly than to the uh, western part of Siberia. 
So the next thing, uh, how do we know that there was not enough money and there was deficit of copper coins uh, in the region, especially in the eastern part of Siberia, is the market rates that it was exchanged. So just a small example is 1818. And uh, it's the monthly information on the exchange between traders on the market in private yards of gold, silver coins against banknotes. And banknotes against the copper coins presented to the civil governor. So, I mean, it's all written in Russia, but if you see here for, uh, if, so what they basically say is that they're exchanging, they're describing the exchange of copper coins against assignations at that time, paper money, this type of paper money. And for high nominal assignations, uh, for high nominal paper money, uh, you could exchange at a rate of eight kopeik per one ruble. For low nominal uh, paper money, you could exchange three kopeik against one ruble of paper money. What does it say? It's irregardless of the uh, nominals, we're talking about copper is more valued than paper money generally. So either there were more paper money than copper or less copper than paper money. But anyway, paper, uh, copper was in high value. And probably because of not so much um, of its minor uh, volume. And next thing is, and if we, if we think, um, and it, it goes, it, go, it is talking about eastern part of Siberia, in the western part of Siberia, the, it could have been a little bit different, yeah, because the, the, obviously there should be more money there. And, but still, it does, it does show the picture that is happening in Irkutsk at that period of time. Uh, does it actually mean that copper coins were not used or they were saved instead of being exchanged because there were so few of them? Well, they probably were used for example, for paying uh, taxes. This is the statement of taxes um, in Irkutsk, uh, in Guild Society, 1844. Again, you see I'm jumping from, from one year to another. This is why I'm saying that it's not about dynamics, it's more about discrete, discrete facts um, that can prove or may not prove what I say. But still, we find that we don't see in uh, what unit um, the taxes are quoted. It should be quoted in silver because it's already the silver standard here. But again, there is no way you can pay it in silver. So there is no other way but to pay it in uh, copper, even at a market exchange rate. Next thing that, let us, let us see what's the next. Just a second. What about, uh, what about the other types of uh, coins? In, in, the, in Siberia. Well, again, uh, these were taken from the archives documents and you can see basically what they say that I'm honored to report exchange for gold and silver coin never happened. And this was taken from uh, this small paper that we were talking about here is written silver and gold was not happening in 1818. I don't have the photograph of another one. And it also states already in 1839 that City Doom informs that during the last month there was no silver circulating around the traders at the market. So the situation didn't change much during that period of time. Either in 1818 or in 1839, there was no circulation of silver and gold. And it is quite natural if you think that silver and gold were used uh, mainly for inter-regional, inter-trans-border transactions. And even before we were talking about that in the previous lecture, that silver was more used for paying, for example, army abroad or for paying for foreign transactions. And another example, uh, again, is was, was the things can, can, we, can we say that uh, they used silver coins in Irkutsk? Well, again, the same example as before. Now you see that they're quoted in silver coins, but uh, to my mind, I can assume that they're all paid again in copper coins because of this fractional part here. 
Another example is, the, is taken from the Legal Act in 1843. Again, the amount of salary is, is just, uh, is, 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 this salary is not possible to pay in uh, silver coins because the lowest nominal is five and there is no nominal as like one kopeik to, to pay f 58. So again, we can assume that they were using copper coins instead. All right, and here is important because it's a daily payment. It's not even the accumulated uh, sum. So it's just every day you have to pay a certain, certain uh, sum. So even if we could imagine that in the monthly payment, they will add up and give us uh, um, the whole figure um, in Tigger, uh, still, I mean, the daily one shows us that it's not possible to do. Next thing, uh, and but if we go further on, for example, in 1855, we see again, again salaries of military, and this time they're quoted in the way that it, it is possible to assume that they were paid in silver. And it doesn't contradict the thing that we were talking about previous lecture, that uh, army was not only paid in copper, but also in silver, in silver rubles. And here you see the five kopeik you can use it for paying this sum and this sum as well. And again, I underline that that is an Eastern Siberia documents. This is why if we prove that there were some kind of occurrence of silver coins there, then for sure they should be in the Western part as well. All right. the closer we move to the 19th century. And this, is, this book is actually is 1889, but uh, let us see. But it is actually um, the, the events that are described in this book, and the book is the Traveler's Book, is winter 1886-87. So the Traveler, Lionel Going, is describing his his travel around Siberia from Vladivostok to the European part of Russia. And what he says, he's describing the Vladivostok itself, and you can see the description. A silver ruble is occasionally seen, but even when found, it is only to be obtained at an expenditure of at least one and a half ruble notes. And furthermore, you can read it. So what does it prove? It does prove that silver rubles were in use, but very rarely. And he also says that Vladivostok was the place where you could find more silver rubles than anywhere else. And it doesn't contradict the fact that Vladivostok is a port. So it's the import export point. Uh, this is why it's, it should be that silver rubles are circling the, uh, circulating there. And still we, see, we also see that uh, as far as that Paper money is also circulating there, so Eastern part does also uh, did also have uh, paper money. All right, so now we're going to talk about the credit uh, relations that happened uh, in in Siberia, and here you can see this part right here, very famous for being dominated by credit relations. Uh, the province of Zabaykalsk, particularly in Nerchinskaya area, was known by dominated, uh, dominated by credit. So um, wholesale merchants were giving retail merchants the credit for their products, while retail merchants were uh, making deals and credit deals with uh, those that were living there. And then again, uh, and then the deal was struck. Once they received the local products, they gave it to the merchant, and the credit was closed. So this whole chain of uh, of connection uh, was made uh, under credit relation, credit uh, conditions. And against the future delivery of products. And the credit was used in case of, um, well, peasants didn't have enough products to exchange, uh, or in case of seasonality, um, in case you were dealing with nomads. Again, they, nomads, 
the seasonality factor actually uh, influenced both peasants and nomads. Uh, but still, there was no other way than using credit because the territory is huge. The, there is seasonality not only on accumulation of products from the European part of uh, Russia, but also the production of products inside the territory and the distribution of products around the territory. So the seasonality factor did influence uh, how the products were moving and how the money was moving as well, because sometimes you just, there was literally not possible to cross the Baikal, for example. Uh, there were, everyone was waiting till winter and ice and so on and so forth. So there was no other way but to, um, to use credit relations and uh, people were in high uh, coherence with each other, knowing each other pretty well. But we will talk about that a little bit further on. And let's take a look again at the dis uh, description found. It's the middle of the 19th century and the Russian statistician uh, giving the statistical overview of Siberia. He's describing how uh, hunters were forced actually to borrow from uh, merchants when the hole was small or when there was seasonality. And there is an interesting thing here that the relationship was so, so close that the person, the lender, was even paying you taxes on the promise of receiving goods uh, in the future. And here he describes it twice a year, December and March. And it could happen that the hole is still small, so he will wait the next year, and the next year he's going to pay your taxes, uh, taxes of a nomad, because everyone was actually uh, had to pay taxes. So the, it, it does prove that everyone is very, was very connected to each other, dependent on each other. And the lender was as much dependent on the borrower as the borrower was dependent on the lender. Another example is happening, and here is, I'm sorry, here is um, the general description of the territory of the Siberia, uh, particularly, no, giving you a mistake, not the general, but this, this certain area. And here is the description of the Boyska region, the one that we were discussing before, this one, the one that I told you that was very known for being dominated by currency, and still you find description of in-kind credit relations, again with nomads. And here the unit of account is a fish, Muksun, and he's describing uh, the relation, price relation with other uh, commodities. And uh, you see, so once a fisher receives a credit from a merchant, he gives wooden sticks, which very, it resembles a tally stick, right? Which cuts signifying the amount of borrowed and then you cut the stick further once you are um, closing, closing your debt. But, but still you see that even the western part of Siberia did have credit relations. Uh, again, it's more connected to tribes that didn't have money. It was not practical to carry money with you because they were kind of heavy. Uh, they had products or uh, they were very dependent on the resources around them. So there was no way but to first use credit relations and second used in-kind uh, trade. And this gives us another point, the trade, not the trade with China, but, but the butter deal and trade with China was uh, one of the examples of that. So the butter, butter was, the next point is the butter deals that were used around Siberia, western and eastern part. Um, again, it was used, I was describing that in the previous uh, slides, um, when describing the delivery, future delivery of goods. So the butter was used with nomads again and with peasants again. It was not only used for the internal trade, but also for the external trade. And here is the very famous example of the trade uh, with China, the trading point Kyachta, where commodities were used and the uh, state was completely against in uh, 19th century, was against of uh, using uh, by Russians coins in trade with China. They were 
prohibiting to use money in trade with Chinese people. There were some reasons for that. If you want, I will explain a little bit later. And, but before 1800, actually, um, you can find the description here that they, they used money. They used money. Uh, it doesn't contradict the thing that we were discussing previously, that in 18th century silver coins, small exchange silver coins were freely circulating around the, the territory. So why not using that to trade with Chinese? But in 19th century, there was only in-kind uh, commodity exchange with Chinese and uh, the unit of account was a commodity. Parcel of silk, Kitaika, was the first, um, you, um, first unit of account and then they transferred to the T as a unit of account. And the T had so much influence that even there was a trade road called T Road from Kachta region to the European part of Russia and even further than St. Petersburg. Um, to Nizhny Novgorod and further to St. Petersburg. So, so this one is a very famous example of in-kind trade. And we find also examples from, again, another travel book by George Cannon. And this, is, this was published in 1881, but it's basically 1867 that he is describing. You can see um, that, first of all, he was living around the tribes, Karyaks, uh, the tribes. And these tribes were again using barter deals as we were uh, discussing that before. So money could not be used to advantage in payment for native labor. And tea, sugar, and tobacco were, were in every preferable way. And this is interesting that people were even ready to accept the commodities even if they were um, traded undervalued. You see, a laborer, a teamster who would demand 20 rubles in money for a month's work was entirely satisfied if we gave him eight pounds of tea and 10 pounds of sugar that costed, the uh, costed 10 rubles. So they were even ready for the undervalued deal. Um, as much because they were valuing so much the commodities. Another example, again, given by the same traveler, he again shows that payment was made in tea, sugar, and tobacco, and other art articles of merchandise, traders' own valuation, so that the natives actually realized only a little more than the half of the nominal price. So he assumes that the natives were ready to uh, receive products that were cheaper than if they received it in money. Um, money for their own products. So there was an exchange and not for their profit. And they were still ready, ready for this deal. So this is interesting because it is the end of the 19th century and still the barter is happening there. Uh, we are, the years that we were talking about, they are quite close to the end of the 19th century. And let me see where we are. All right, so we are moving towards the concluding remark. The internal trade was concentrated around places of inhabitants and, okay, so large distances between the cities made it practically impossible for peasants to travel, to travel around Siberia on a regular basis. So most regions were self-sufficient and dependent on uh, seasonal factors. And the way that internal trade was organized, I was describing that many times on the conferences, was a very interesting one. There was three general stages of goods movement around the territory, the goods accumulation, intermediate goods exchange, and final goods exchange. So goods accumulation happened in the storage cities, like huge cities like Irkutsk and Taborsk, Products were brought there and they were brought in wholesale and they were controlled by wholesale merchants, uh, merchandise, uh, houses. They could stay in a storage city like in Irkutsk for several months, depending on the season. Then there would be exchange with, re with retail mer merchant who received these goods and at that particular moment he might even not have something in exchange. 
he might have money to, to give or if there is a deal uh, and if a whole wholesale merchant is more interested in local products uh, then he has deals with many retailers uh, in in-kind way but still the retail retail merchant uh, is move is actually occurring in the intermediate goods exchange he takes the products and there can be several steps. He can make another exchange with another retail merchant. And then the final thing is happening when with the merchant that is approaching villages and locals and nomads, because the general interest from the Siberia is definitely fur and sable and uh, local products. So. Uh, here, the movement could be really, it, the chain can be really, really long, in, in, including in-kind and barter deals, including credit relations. And if we're talking about Western part of Siberia, there, there the uh, moving of product is, is shorter because there are more people, uh, the territory is close to, is, is a little more intense. Uh, it's easier to approach the cities, the distances are smaller. And if we're talking about Eastern part, then this chain is really huge. And there is a whole indebtedness of the region because of these constant um, intermediaries uh, involved uh, until you reach the final, the final market. And so uh, what we're going to conclude here is, first of all, I assume that in 18th century, silver small exchange coins were used in Siberia and fewer copper coins were used in Siberia. Still, it doesn't prove that they were freely circulating and it doesn't prove that they were dominating uh, the regions because to my mind, in the 18th century, barter was more of a deal. In 19th century, we find evidence of the circulation or at least appearance of copper coins and usage of copper coins and fewer descriptions of the usage of silver coins, as well as uh, usage of paper money, the one that we were describing in uh, seeing in the travelers' books and in um, reports of the officials. Still, uh, uh, we can't, um, yeah, so full stop here. The next point is we find evidence of the shortage of copper coins and we can assume why, why there was a shortage due to transportation costs, seasonal factors, um, seasonal production and distribution of goods. Next one is for sure the barter deals that was a common, common thing for the eastern part of Siberia populated by nomads around 38% by the end of the 19th century and also happening to the western part of Siberia around 25% um, of the population in the, by the end of the 19th century. And the credit-based deals that were mainly happening in, in those territories that first of all had very inelastic supply of copper coins and very coherent relationship between each other and really hard conditions to move freely around the territories and buy goods and having fewer fairs and trading points. And at the end wanted to give a really nice example that I found in the travels book of uh, Olaf Swenson. He was a trader for almost 40 years in Siberia. He even managed to trade during, after the revolution for like six or seven years, uh, having lost almost everything during the revolution and then striking a deal with the government afterwards. But still he was, before, before that period of time, he was trading with the uh, Chukchas. And he was explaining how he won the trust of the tribe. And you can imagine that it is a very important point because you meet the tribe only once per year. And if you cheat or if you fail to give a high quality product or to prove that you, are, can, you can be trusted, then you lose the client. And this is the way the Eastern part of Siberia was working at that period of time. These tribes, they were coming at most two times a year, at most, but mainly once per year. So you see your client only once per year, you need 
to be trusted. So you're very, you're very connected to, to your client. You're very dependent to, uh, upon your client. Um, and in this relationship, once you want the trust, you are able to use credit relations pretty well because you know that the tribe knows you. They come particularly to you after they have this certain trust. And, and he's all, he was also describing the example of his friend as a merchant. Uh, in this example, he was saying that uh, this merchant used to have to, to strike credit deals like for 200 days. And so this was, this was the way the, tr the trade was organized with the uh, inhabitants and uh, nomads and um, tribes. So I guess so far we are at the end of our lecture and you can ask me questions if you want. Thank you very much. It seems to be a kind of economy without coins. Yeah, it does. But still, if we, if we didn't have these documents uh, with some certain, um, like the one here, with some certain sums collected already, these are the sums that were already collected. It's a statement of revenues, right? So I guess they should have something to collect. But basically, it's the administrative side of the truth, right? While it doesn't prove that the coins were used in trade itself. And what, what about the copper? Uh, is it coming from Sweden? Um, in, in, especially in, in Petersburg. You, you mean, is it coming as a material? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, before from Persia, red, red copper. But mm. what, where you see it here, like this period is Persia. And here, Yekaterinburg had, had its own resources. And Petersburg is uh, receiving medal from Sweden. Uh, I, I think I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's like this period of time. I'm not sure that we had problems of finding copper at the end of the 19th century. I mean, the 19th century itself was a boost of uh, excavation thing for yeah, gold yeah. and silver. But I have no information for copper, honestly. But it seems that, well, um, I've seen documents uh, where it was said that the copper was sent from Yekaterinburg to St. Petersburg. I've seen this uh, in correspondence. And there is no relation between China, uh, China and uh, Siberia. I mean, uh, there is a lot of copper in, in China. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. uh, it seems there is no exportation of uh, this copper to, to Siberia. Um, hard to well, say. It's difficult to export uh, yeah. copper, of course. Yeah, 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 hard to say right now. And uh, what about notes? Notes? Yeah. Well, you, uh, notes are seen and are undervalued very mm -hmm. much at that period of time, even, even at the end of the 19th century. So if we're talking about the assignation notes, yeah, they were the age that we were talking about, 1818, was the period when they were very in poor condition, like really bad day for them and they lost three-fourths of their values but here they are even they are not considered as as money trustworthy as money anyway because when you see three kopeik against one, ru one ruble it's the loss of 98 percent of your value for a person so and the same goes maybe in smaller amounts but but here, half one and a half ruble notes for one ruble means also depreciation of the paper money uh, in that region. So it's mainly barter. Mm -hmm. Credit and in-kind transactions. Okay, thanks. Thank you.